Hey everybody, Coach here. Hey, welcome back. And I'm sorry for the absence the past week or so. I know that it's been uh, kind of hit and miss with us right now, but there are so many things going on, including, including our cross-country journey we are in the middle of right now. That cross-country journey going from northern Maine to southern Idaho. It is our uh, trailer collection trip, which I know I have mentioned in the past. What a trip it has been so far. Yes, we are just on the cusp yesterday of a new spring season, but many parts of our country here in the U.S. is still gripped by winter, and we have felt its uh, cold, bony finger in many, many places already. We have had uh, whiteout conditions in our state of Ohio. We have had sub-freezing temperatures in Massachusetts and New York. And now we are in the windswept upper Midwest in the capital city of Lincoln, Nebraska. We're talking about a couple, three or four uh, landscape problems that uh, people face and some possible techniques and applications to kind of correct them. We're talking about screening this week and screening for at least four problems. Constant wind, blowing snow, privacy, and sound. Hey, let's get going. I am so glad you're joining me. I hope you get something from this one. And if you're over on the YouTube channel, please, what I'm really asking for today is a little call to action that if you watch any of the videos on YouTube, I'm noticing that a lot of people who watch aren't subscribing. And I would greatly appreciate a subscribe. Maybe you don't watch us every week. Maybe you only watch us four times a year, but subscribe anyway. It really does help us out a lot. All right, onward. Hey friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show, and we'll see you right here next week. You know, over the past four years, Maestro and I have seen a lot of this North American continent, and I know these landscape challenges that I just mentioned are not unique to here. Certainly not. They exist around the globe to varying degrees. Sometimes a lot more intense, other times a lot less, but they do exist. And as homeowners, oftentimes we have to address them to improve our living conditions, the safety and well-being of our dwellings, and uh, the overall, uh, you could say, conservation of the property that we pay so much money for. One of the things that we have seen is traveling the highways and byways, we have seen many property owners address these issues in a myriad of ways, both natural and man-made. These challenges kind of arise from local and regional environmental issues, issues such as prevailing weather patterns, storm patterns, local topography, surrounding traffic issues, and property layout, to say just a few. You know, we've crossed much of uh, our country of America in the past week. And like I said, I'm recording today from the capital city of Lincoln, Nebraska, in about a constant 25 mile an hour wind, which is why we're kind of sitting still today because of our uh, high profile vehicle that we travel in. I'm getting really tired of having the steering wheel cocked about 90 degrees, just trying to go straight because the wind wants to push you wherever it's coming from. It wants to push you where it's going. Kind of constant and very hard to drive in for much of the time. So we thought today that we'd kind of take a zero day, catch up on some of our computer work, record this podcast and hopefully a video if the wind dies down a bit. So let's kick off our first problem with that issue right there, wind. You know, at Brook and Pond, we're kind of fortunate, but then we only took about four years to find Brook and Pond. Many people don't have quite that uh, amount of time or luxury in order to find the perfect spot. And I am not saying that Brook and Pond is a perfect spot. It just happens to be a spot where wind isn't the highest uh, problem priority for us. For us, it's more of a, a water control issue, a drainage issue, 
and in some cases, especially on December 21st, getting some sun on the house because we're so far north and the forest kind of surrounds us. So we get just a little bit of sun in December and then come uh, May, June, and July, we'll be in full blazing sun, no problem. And one of the things about wind up there, because we are so forest surrounded and we tend to be on uh, a westerly slope and the prevailing winds, there aren't really any prevailing winds. Unless we have a storm that comes off the Atlantic, which we have experienced, or a storm that comes out of Canada, which we have experienced, in between, there isn't a lot of wind. There are breezes, uh, which actually make it nice in the warmer part of the year, but there's not a prevailing wind like what we're sitting in right now or what may be the southeast part of our country, western Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, southern Colorado, southern Nevada, where the springtime winds are just like a small hurricane almost 24 hours a day. There's also the Chinook winds up in the northwest that tend to be uh, kind of prevailing at certain times during the year. So wind can make uh, outdoor enjoyment, heat conservation, and just overall uh, property values can kind of be a weird twist on the normal. People who are born and raised in certain areas and have just grown up with the wind, it's just another Thursday, and I get that. But for some people, maybe someone who's uh, transplanting from out of state or out of country and have not experienced a constant wind all the time, it's irritating as hell. And there are some things that you can do landscape-wise in order to... Uh, mitigate it and curb it just a little bit. Our friends that we're staying with right now, they have just a smattering of deciduous trees and some evergreens on the north side of their five acre place here. And it works eh, a little bit, but not that much. It really doesn't. It's not really done in a, in a form or a fashion that was specifically addressed to wind. Now, solutions for wind control, wind abatement, wind diversion are very, very independent depending on from one location to another. There are certain things in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere where winds from uh, incoming storms change the whole direction as far as where the wind comes out of. And it's obviously temporary, which each passing storm system from where I used to be in northern California the the incoming storms the winds would always come out of the south southeast and then when they left the winds would turn around and they'd come out of the north and northwest as the storm systems progressed from west to east and it may be uh, exactly the opposite down for you guys down under oh, that was a horrible australian accent i won't do that again to you guys i don't want <laughs> that was embarrassing but for you it might depend on your location like i told you the southwest uh, some of the prevailing winds in the Midwest. I have driven across this country this past week and have uh, battled a north-northwest wind where it was just hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of miles of just being rocked back and forth all day long, driving, driving, driving. So I'm thinking as I'm driving across the interstate called I-80 for us and looking at some of the the farms and fields and other places where uh, rural uh, landowners exist, you see various things that address the wind situation. And it's not only for the wind, but it's also for our next segment called snow mitigation as well. It may require multiple solutions and addressing landscape screenings in more than one part of your property. Prevailings is obviously a top priority, but storms as well is another priority. And then you have the whole other segment we have regarding privacy. So it may require multiple locations where you're having to address these landscape issues. Now, my experience, both as a designer and as a witness to various parts of the country where they've had to address these things, height and depth is key when it comes to wind mitigation. Evergreens and deciduous trees, even layers upon layers of deciduous trees in the wintertime still break up the wind tremendously. I have seen it right on the side of the highway and felt it in my steering wheel. I really have. Evergreens are good and in a residential 
or not necessarily residential, but a rural setting, you're going to need a lot of them. And then you're going to have to take the old patient's tonic for many, many years, depending on your soil conditions, depending on water situation, etc. Because it's going to be a long time before those uh, windbreaks are large enough and uh, robust enough to actually send wind up and over and around your outdoor living area, property, and homestead. Uh, it's amazing how much energy is lost by a prevailing wind that uh, comes through a property every day. Where the wind just blows on that house constantly, if you can have a hot, hot, dry wind in the summertime and you can have a frigidly Arctic type wind in the wintertime and it just sucks the heat right out of your house. So by slowing and diverting those prevailing windy conditions, you can oftentimes actually throw a few dollars in your pocket from heat and cool savings. So as far as structuring your windbreak, you're going to think of shrubs and trees that are going to go uh, upwards of 25 to 30 feet tall. Shrubs, shrubs are going to be on both the windward and the leeward side. And the center of your windbreak is going to be primarily evergreens. And what our goal is, is to lift that prevailing wind from a shorter side on the windward side to a taller side on the, the leeward side. So we're taking wind and throwing it up at an angle and throwing it around the windscreen so that it avoids and slows down a lot by the time it hits your house, if at all. Two-story homes? Two-story homes are just the hardest to protect for obvious reasons of height. There's nothing on a podcast or a video that I could offer you uh, that is protection for a two-story home. It, it, there, I just can't think of one, except for uh, choose your properties carefully. And if you have a two-story home, hopefully you have hillsides and other things that uh, mitigate prevailing winds. Think about that when you're out there looking to purchase. Like I said, screening should be a minimum of 25 to 30 feet tall. And the thicker you make that windscreen, at the base, the better. I would easily say on a rural piece of property, if you could make that thing 40 feet wide or wider, you're gonna get much more effective windbreak for sure. Evergreens need to be kind of stout, yet with a little bit of flexibility. I have seen uh, pines and spruces that are left to stand on their own. They, they don't stand a chance, <laughs> literally. They break easily. Uh, they're kind of brittle, especially in the wintertime, and they kind of need their brothers and sisters around them spaced correctly in order to support. The other thing to expect, and you got to set your expectations at a reasonable level, and that is uh, it should be a very top priority to get such a windbreak at least established and started as soon as you own the property. Maybe before you even build is to get a windbreak uh, going. There are some states don't hold me to all of these, but uh, I know like at least in the state of Minnesota in the United States, there's actually state programs that encourage and can help even a little bit of financial on growing uh, wind breaks and snow breaks. It is very, very good in agricultural areas and it also helps for wildlife habitat when you have places like that. So look into your state and your local area to see if maybe there could be a little, uh, a little help financially putting in something like that. If you look at the cost of trees and shrubs nowadays, I'm scared to death later this year when I'm gonna have to go to the nursery and try and buy stuff. My God, I compared to when I was even contracting and stopping in like 2018, 19, things have almost doubled. And uh, I just don't totally understand why, but I'm sure there's a, a cost that's incurred in the last five, six years that causes such a dramatic rise. But that's a whole nother topic. So when you're talking about your windscreens, planting density is important as well. Don't overplant and cause a shade die out years later. All plants that you're gonna be using will need their sun and their space uh, to perform their best. So knowing your mature size of what you're putting in the ground 
and what the actual tactical placement of these plants, both shrubs and trees, how they're going to work for you. If you know that one of your evergreen shrubs that you're putting on the windward side is gonna go 10 by 10, well then don't plant it four feet apart and expect it to do super well years down the road. It's gonna get crowded and part of it is gonna die out. So remember to space it out appropriately so that mature sizing you have a nice thick but healthy plant material. Planting in such a way that causes uh, wind lift is also a good strategy. Short and thick in the windward side and rising up to the leeward side will, that will cause the problem wind to lift and also horizontally go around your homestead at least as much as possible. And it can pass over one story homes. Uh, landscape screens can also be used in conjunction with buildings and outbuildings to break up wind and divert wind away from uh, desirable areas. Barns and shops and other buildings, extra garages, uh, sheds, those, these types of things can be used in conjunction with plantings in order to double and triple the effect. So let's move on to uh, snow mitigation. When it comes to uh, snow mitigation, we have had our hands full this last week. We have had driving snow. We have had near whiteout conditions in the state of Ohio that were so bad that, man, I'm telling you, uh, I have never driven in whiteout conditions before. We have very selectively selected where we are during the times of year that are gonna be subjected to that. But hey, we don't have much choice right now. So across uh, south of Cleveland, Ohio, yeah, we were in uh, some heavy, heavy snow. So what we have seen done quite successfully, and that is man-made snow breaks, snow fences, in conjunction with planting screens and snow screens. So when it comes to the snow fences, I've seen these placed by uh, governmental agencies, counties and states and federals that break up snow from going across interstates and other busy roadways. And I've also seen them placed by landowners as well on the windward side of where uh, prevailing snowstorms drive snow across and into houses and blocking vehicles, etc. They're compiled of both plant material and man-made fencing. And this is how you mitigate, slow down and even stop a lot of the snow from becoming problematic closer to your house. It allows for traffic safety, it allows for uh, homeowner safety and comfort, and obviously this is more appropriate to rural properties than it is for smaller suburb or city lots. They, they don't get that as much. What uh, the suburbs generally have is more like snowplow problems. Uh, more than anything else. Many trees and shrubs are kind of mirrored in this snow application as in the wind application, but the depth is not quite as critical for the snow as it is for the wind diversion. Uh, you can have a little thinner wall because snow can get knocked down and held in place by a five foot screen just as easy as it would have been a 25 foot screen. But usually wind drives snow, so think of the same kind of strategy. Uh, but if snow is the only problem occasionally during the winter with accompanied you know, from the winds of a storm front, maybe only a winter snow fence is necessary. That'll, that'll mitigate it to the point where it leaves you and your dwelling safe. And then you take it down in late spring and put it back up in late fall. These applications can deter and greatly mitigate drifting snow against homes, buildings, driveways, etc. cetera. Uh, you don't need that, that headache when it's 10 below zero and a 30 mile an hour wind and it's piling up snow against the driver's door of your truck or car and you need to go to work. So think about perimeter safety and knocking down that wind and knocking down driving snow. All right, let's move on to privacy. Probably one of the biggest inquiries I get as a uh, landscape educator is about privacy screening. It is important from a couple of perspectives. Visual screening, obviously, but also sound screening. I'll be honest with you here. Privacy screening is achievable fairly easily. I mean, visual screening is not hard. You just have to get it in the ground one way or another and 
allow it to grow or build it. That's the easiest way, depending on space and location needed. Now, as far as the sound, I'll address that in just a minute in the next segment. Now, think of this. Evergreens are the order of the day here. Not just evergreens from the conifer world, but also evergreens from shrub world as well. Biggest application I have seen is the standard six foot neighbor fence. Uh, where the six foot fence just isn't high enough uh, to appropriately screen out the neighbor's prying eyes. Uh, I th <laughs> Personally, I think seven feet is, should be a standard, but most of the time code calls for six foot with occasional stuff in backyard applications. But as far as privacy screening, if you are dealing with a two story home next to you and you live in a one story home, your problem has been magnified 10x, it really has. That one is much more difficult to overcome, it really is. Privacy can be attained through screening plants and placed in such a way that a, a total or at least a partial visual screening can be achieved. Other ways is just build screens, temporarily or permanently, that kind of cordon off prying eyes by uh, areas that you call private, your master bedroom window, maybe a hot tub area, maybe a, a spa area attached to your pool. These kind of areas could benefit from privacy screening, sound screening, and wind screening. It really could, and you have to think it out. It might be uh, man-made and then have plantings growing up while your man-made screening is working for you. Just remember, building screens is a real quick an instantaneous way of uh, making the screen and then follow up with correct plantings that are going to give you visual screening over the long haul as they grow and mature. Now keep something in mind. Remember topography comes into play as well and you need to think about this when you're out there shopping for property. Topography comes into play when you have not necessarily two-story homes next to you but more like a hillside and you have homes up above you. It could be 10 feet above you or it could be 100 feet above you. It all depends. You have to look at those surroundings as you're shopping for homes and understand that if you have properties that are 100 feet above you, you're not going to be able to do hardly anything from the prying eyes that might be up there. You might be able to build some type of an enclosure or screening or a patio cover or something that uh, keeps eyes off of you as you're enjoying your outdoor living areas. But for the most part, do not rely on visual screening from a hillside application. You want to be the one up on top of the hill. You don't want to be the one down in the fishbowl. And there's nothing you're going to be able to plant, even redwood trees, spruce trees, uh, cedar trees. They're going to take 150 years to grow up tall enough to screen out some of your yard. And you're not gonna be around for that. So think about uh, micro areas that you need to build something in order to achieve privacy. Lastly, let's talk about sound. A two-prong approach to this problem will depend on a couple of things. Space, how much space you actually have to uh, build up and plant up in order to try to achieve some type of sound dampening, but also if you're in a rural setting, you may have the option to do what they call uh, berm plantings as well. I have seen these along county roads and I have seen these along interstates where landowners have imported hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cubic yards of soil in order to build up as much as 10 to 12 feet high berms and 30 to 40 feet wide at the base. And then they'll come in and they'll They'll plant their trees and their shrubs, and they get a sound dampening and privacy screening goal achieved. But still, you have to remember, you're, maybe the house is 50 yards from this berm, or maybe 300 yards from this berm, and sound travels up and over and around from its source. And you're oftentimes not, I mean, you could spend $200,000 or more uh, on soils and dirt and importation and labor and plant material. And then you have a house that's 150 yards away and you're not, it's not going to do a lot. Visually, aesthetically, it's probably very pretty. 
but as far as sound dampening, it's the hardest thing to achieve in um, landscape world. It just really is. Even the brick and mortar sound barrier walls that they put along freeways doesn't dampen everything. It reduces it to a certain amount. And look, they have to make them 20 feet tall or higher and someone's backyard is right on the other side there. And I would assume that the closer to some kind of a wall like that, the even more decibel reduction you're gonna get. It's when you move away from that wall and the sound has come up and over and flooded out into the neighborhood that a house across the street or the next street is gonna be worse. I can remember having a house on a beautiful tree-lined street. One of the last, the last houses I had uh, in the Central Valley. And the noisiest part was not the street that I lived on. It was relatively quiet. It was the busy boulevard that was a block and a half away. And you could not dampen down that very much. You really couldn't. And there was trees and yards probably six deep before it hit that boulevard. And yet still, it was kind of noisy at times. But there's certain situations that no matter what you do, you're not going to be able to reduce or eliminate sound. Here's, here's one example. What about a, a trucker's jake break? You're at the bottom of a hill there where there's truckers coming across. When we were in, uh, I think it was the state of Indiana a few days ago, there was a, a county road, or a, basically a, it was a two-lane state highway, and it was a trucker's route. And all night long, all we heard was a jake break from truckers at the bottom of this hill. It was a horrible, horrible situation trying to rest and get up early the next morning, get the hell out of there. It, it was bad. So I, how, how would you landscape around that kind of a problem? Or how about the, an ambulance or a police or fire car, that fire truck that's going by? You're not gonna be able to dampen a siren. You're just not. But the one that I find most annoying in anything, and that's someone who wants to roll all their windows down and then thump their stereo so loud that uh, it literally is almost vibrating. Never did understand that kind of rudeness before. I guess that's why we have uh, took four years and located ourselves in such a place that at least through my golden years, I don't have to listen to that kind of stuff hardly ever at all, which is just wonderful. It really is. So to wrap up, let's go over a short list of trees and shrubs that you might want to consider depending on what zone you're in and be able to uh, plant them in order to achieve these kinds of uh, effects for wind, snow, privacy, and sound. Now, all of these are, for the most part, evergreens, uh, both evergreen conifer type of trees, but also evergreen shrubs. And you can use them in various applications. Here they are. The spruce family, the fir family, cedar, arborvitae, pine, redwood, holly, taxus yew, junipers, photinia, cypress, bay laurel, bamboo, make sure you get the clumping, cherry laurel, viburnum, magnolia, privet, and in some cases, boxwood. All of these will help in putting a, a screen of one kind or another together in order for you to achieve. There's also a lot of local uh, native type of uh, trees and shrubs, service berry, hawthorn, and other selections. Basically, your local nursery, your local state ag extension, these guys can point you in the direction of ones that are used quite frequently and uh, see how they work out for you. Anyway, that's what I have for you. I appreciate your time and I hope you got a little something out of this. If you don't mind, head on over to the website, youryardcoach.com. Hey, check out the book and the course, maybe pick up a checklist. And if you have any questions regarding this topic or any other landscape topic, feel free to email me, youryardcoach at gmail.com. I appreciate your interest. Sure would love to get a subscription from you over on the YouTube channel. I noticed that uh, looking at analytics, it's about 10% subscribed and 90% just coming and going. And it would greatly help us out tremendously if you got in there and help our algorithm by boosting our subscribers just a little bit. Anyway, hey, I'll see you guys next week. As always, to your landscape success, bye for now.